Welcome to My Life in Four Traits, Dave. It's great to have you. Thank you. Great to see you and great to be here. So before we dive into your four trades, and I'm so you've had such an interesting life, I'm really curious to talk about it a little bit. But tell us, kind of bring us back to the beginning. Tell us a little bit about where you grew up, what you what were you like as a kid? Wow. Um, you know, I grew up in a, a in Fort Worth, Texas, uh, and my family had been there for several generations. And um, as a kid, I was most interested in, I guess, what you would call natural science. I loved to go out and collect lizards and snakes and all that and 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 studied a lot about it and you know that's the one trade that I probably should have that was probably a bad trade from the beginning to get involved in everything else because it's really your first love (laughs) that's my first love and I still find myself going back to it but um it it was a it was a great childhood had great parents um it was uh as I got older uh, there were two things that kind of made me who I am, I think. I, I, and I was just lucky, you know, it was just pure luck to, to be in the, in the um, environment and situation that I was. One of them was that I had a very peripatetic grandmother who loved to travel, but who was ornery, and nobody got along with her except me. So from about the age of six, um, she and I would go on these trips, and, and by the time I was nine or ten, we would travel internationally. And so wow. by the time I was about 12 or 13, I had been all over the world with her. And we would we would plan, the, she, and she eventually got to, well, where do you want to go this year? Well, how about South America? Okay, well, you write down where you want to go, and she'd give it to her travel agent. And we'd, and we'd just travel What was summer. it about the two of you that, had, that you had such a bond, especially when she wasn't fond of people generally? Um, one thing was I was named for her ex-husband, her, her, her deceased husband. Oh, okay. And... Um, uh, the other thing is that I'm, you know, I'm not a person who gets easily offended. And so I just, you know, she did what she did and I did what I did and it was all fine. But I also loved, uh, it, it, it created in me a love of travel. So, you know, I would look forward to the end of school and we would get going and, you know, it, wherever it was, Africa, Southeast Asia, uh, would, a lot in Europe, but she was willing to go anywhere. Amazing. She lived to 98 and, um. And we're still doing this in in her early nineties, you know. And she'd go into the hospital and then come out and travel somewhere. She's <laughs> one of these, you know, Victorian kind of women, <laughs> strong and sturdy. Um, and the other was my dad. Uh, was a very interesting fellow. He was an artist. Um, he uh, had been captain of two ships in World War II. Um, he also had from an he had an early childhood experience that was interesting as well and that that was this that grandmother and and her husband um his father uh took him all over the american west and he became um i will the word obsessed is probably not the best word but he became um very interested in american indians and he met a lot of the of the older indians who had fought the white man and were now on reservations and they inducted him into the ogallala sioux tribe at age 15. And he, they also gave him a lot of objects that he, he, you know, his parents bought a lot of these objects. So it ended up a collection of about 1,200 American Indian, you know, works of art and objects of life, uh, which I just grew up in the house with. So it was, yeah. you know, it was a house full of shamanistic objects. That, so, you know, it was just, it was not an ordinary childhood. And again, it's just luck, but, um, but it really kind of shaped, I think, everything that I've done since then. Because I've never been a person who followed a path. Yeah. Well, I follow a path that's unusual, but, you know, straight line kind of thing. Yeah. Were you uh, an intelligent child? Um, not to suggest you're not now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I guess so. Mm. I mean, I was certainly a very curious child and, um, you know, read a lot. And, um, and, and, and then the third thing was I had this aptitude for music. And I think I had more of an aptitude than I had a desire for mm. it and but it was something that they recognized and I began studying music theory at age 12 with the head of the local university and and it 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 led me on this path that and this you know is one of the trades I'll talk about but it led me on a path to get very seriously involved with that which meant music is a very demanding mistress you know it, it's 24 7 kind of thing it meant that I had to put aside so many other interests. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, so that's, you know, my childhood and 
however many minutes. Wow, that it sounds like a movie. There's a movie in there, Dave. You Maybe. haven't done it already. There yeah. most certainly is one. Hey, sorry to interrupt again. Uh, it's Raul here from Real Vision. I'd love for you to subscribe to the channel, get the notifications. We have so many incredible conversations with so many amazing people. It will really help you in your financial journey and your journey to understand just what the hell's going on in this world. Anyway, click subscribe, get the notifications and enjoy. So you, your first trade is what you just mentioned. So you, you began in music, but you traded that in. And this is one of your better trades. Is, this is one of yeah. your best trades. Traded in a career in music for something else. You didn't know it at the time, but it sort of led you on a different career path. So right. fill, fill that in. And why did you decide to leave music? You know, um, I, I learned a really valuable lesson there. And that, and I, I can tell you exactly what happened. Um, whenever I would go into a bookstore, there were bookstores in those days. You know. um, <laughs> I hear there's, there's still, still a, a couple. In, <laughs> still a couple in New York and London. But um, whenever I would go, I would I would gravitate to the sections about natural history, um, about science, about philosophy, about history, never music. Mm. And I thought, you know, I'm telling myself something. Mm. And I think if you listen to yourself, you will tell yourself all sorts of things. Most people don't. They, our, our society conditions you not to. It conditions you to say, this is my goal, or I'm going to do this and, and so forth. So I, by the time I was one of these kids who it was a big mistake to do this, but they put me in college very early. Uh, and, and, and so I went to the local college, TCU, which of course is now kind of famous for its sports, but, um, uh, but they had a very good music department. So I got a degree in music um, at uh, age 19. And I had, uh, you know, and I started. So were you playing? Were you composing? I, were was, you... I was a composer and conductor. Wow. And, at um, age 19. Yeah, and, and that's not unusual in music, you know, that. Um, but he says dismissively, well, no, it, it, I mean, a lot of musicians start very, right. Very, because they're sort of yeah. prodigies. Right. And, um, uh, so by the time I was, you know, had gotten that degree and I started, you know, on a very small way on a career and I conducted some orchestras and, you know, and so forth. And there were certainly opportunities that I could have taken advantage of, but I just didn't want to do it. Right. And, you didn't have um, the drive. I didn't have the drive. That's no. exactly the word. I had the, the the aptitude and the talent, but I didn't have the drive. And I could I knew so many people, or still have so many close friends who are musicians, and they have that they have to do it. Yeah, it's their passion. It's, it's their passion, DNA. Yeah, yeah. They have to do it. It's not interesting. And, and and I didn't have to do it. I wanted to do other things. Did you feel guilty because you had a gift and you? Because there's a lot of pressure when you're gifted musically. There is a huge amount of pressure to and, do something with that. Um. I, I felt that I was disappointing people. Uh. Um, I didn't feel guilty per se because I knew it wasn't right for me. But I felt that, you know, and, and, and you, it was visible that people were, you know, oh, he's, he's left music. You know, well, I, I mean, the thing is that it just, it was not something that I, I knew I couldn't do it long term. Yeah. And, I, and I've had friends from those days who stuck with it and were similarly disenchanted and, and it hasn't worked out well. No, I can but imagine that. Yeah. Again, I was really lucky to be in a position where um, I I could uh, I could take some time and and look around for other things. Because what does a tri what does a conductor, a, a nineteen year old composer conductor do next? Exactly. Yeah. And but I had so many things I was interested in, and and I, I lit on archaeology, and and I kind of reprised. Uh, the journey that I had, the journeys I had taken with my grandmother by myself at that point. So I did the whole thing again. I mean, not exactly, but, you know, traveled around lots of places, saw lots of things. Um, you know, that's one of the things, if, if you travel at a very young age like I did, you see a lot of things that probably kids that age shouldn't see. Um, you know, and the world was not a pretty place then any more than it is now. Um, and, uh, but I, I did this whole thing again and, um, and th this is a perfect example of the kind of serendipity that my life is made of. I was in Oaxaca and, uh, and I was at an archeological site called Mitla. Uh, and I, there on the, on the board at, at this little museum was tacked up, I think for the, for the, uh, um, for the employees, you know, I always look very carefully at things like that. 
And it said, you know, buy a hieroglyphic workshop with Linda Sheely, University of Texas, March something. And um, uh, it, it said the latest things in decipherment of the Maya hieroglyphs. Now, everybody who read about archaeology at a, you know, at an uh, amateur level knew that they weren't deciphered, except that they were. And so I, I, I immediately changed my schedule. It was about three weeks away. Went, went to Austin, went to this thing. Um, and she, she and her colleagues, she worked with the people all over the country and internationally. And there was this little group, almost like a hidden university, that had deci- they had deciphered the Maya hieroglyphs. And they were still doing it, and so it was. It was quite something because you had uh, we could tell stories of the kings and queens of ancient America, which we've always been able to do in Egypt and Assyria, at least since you know Champion deciphered the the uh, Egyptian hieroglyphs. And but but for a long time we've had those ancient histories of the old world. They were now putting together the same thing for the new world, and of course the art is amazing. I mean, it's bloody and it's you know, and it, it, it it's um, extraordinarily fine and everything. So I went to the, there's a, a local museum, um, which is very, very well regarded, called the Kimball Art Museum in Fort Worth. And I, I knew the director basically through my parents. And I went and I said, look, you know, you really should do this, you know, look at this art and, and look at this story and you, you should do an exhibit on it. I just wanted to kind of put it in front. And he said, well, we're too busy, but if you want to do it, we'll probably oh show God. up. So with no knowledge <laughs> of how yeah, museums are put together. That I mean, you're a curator. Are, yeah, exactly. And um, so I I said, okay. And um, he said, but, you know, you have to get these loans from the British Museum. There, there are some uh, lentils that, that show um, uh, a, a, a ritual that the king and queen do. Um, to contact the world of the gods and bring them to earth and so forth. And um, and I I said, and he said, good luck getting him. And I said, okay. You know, I don't remember, shied back from a challenge. And um, so I talked to Linda Sheely. I had talked to her before. And she said, yeah, of course I will. I'll do an exhibit at the Kimball. And um, she said, but we really do have to have these things from the British Museum. I said, yeah, I know, I know, I know. Let me, let me work on it. So I found out who, this was long before the internet. Found right, out yellow the, pages, yeah, sort the, of in, in the library, finding that, out That's right, that. that's right. Sent a telegram. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. The the, the keeper, they, they until very recently, they didn't have curators, they had keepers. The keeper of Mesoamerican antiquities, and they would have the keeper. Of, Sounds about right, though. Yeah, and, 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 and <laughs> keeper you know, of the secrets and dark. Uh... kept that terminology, but anyway. Um, so I, I, I literally picked up the phone and got through the, you know, system, and this woman answered. Elizabeth Carmichael was her name, and I said, "Hi, I'm calling you from Texas, and uh, I'm working on uh, an exhibit, um, and I'd like to talk to you about some loans, including these Yashilan dentals." And she said, "Well, we never loan those." And I said, "I know, she, uh, but we're working with Linda Sheely on on an exhibit about Maya hieroglyphic uh, decipherment," and she said, "Oh, Linda Sheely." She said, well, come over and we'll discuss it. So I, it, Linda was the magic name. And by the way, the smartest person I've ever run across. I mean, just brilliant, beyond brilliant um, and generous and, and, you know, just a great person. She died very young of pancreatic cancer. Oh, gosh. In her 50s. Such and, sad. Um, but she had already accomplished all she, this. Right. She, what, yeah. what most of us are still trying to scrape together in a... Exactly. And... Um, uh, and she has her own interesting story. She would tell you that her parents were basically hillbillies, and that was the word she used. And um, and she and her, it's another serendipity story. And I and I love those stories because I think that if you if you let yourself, they always they appear all the time. Yeah, you have and to look for the signs. You have to, and you have to be willing when a door opens to to not only look through it but to step inside it. And some people would say, "Be ready." That's right. So there's a the thing. There's this is a theme that comes up in these conversations because people often talk about luck, mm-hmm. but then by the end of it, you find out that they're also ready. They're ready when yeah. luck comes and, calling, and, and, and to... maybe they're lucky to be that kind of a person. Yeah, have that personality. And maybe yeah. you can't tell Linda's story though because you have to stay on yours. Uh, so anyway, very briefly, she said to her uh, her husband said to her, 
I'm not spending another holiday season with your in-laws. And so they drove to Mexico all the way down to this city called Palenque, which is a classic Maya city. And she got there and it just spoke to her. And she became, she was an art teacher and she became the world's expert in, in Maya. Oh, wow. Big from, so she didn't start out as a decoding. Uh, no. Oh, my goodness. So you get the museum to loan you these things. So, so, and you, um, and you so cement yourself this, as a. I go into this um, this building in Islington in London, which at that time was not fashionable at all. And it was this huge warehouse with no windows. And um, this woman, Elizabeth Carmichael, met me there and she handed me a flashlight. And she said, you'll need this. And so we go into this cavernous room. And it was exactly like that scene at the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark, which hadn't come out yet. But it, it was it was full of, you know, you dark. There were just little narrow, like a prison, little narrow windows up at the top. And um, and we would, uh, you know, you'd, you'd go through these little narrow halls made of things that were in the collection. And you'd come up to a, a Maori statue or an Egyptian god and all this very, very darkly. Illuminated, not, not illuminated really and so we get over to the corner and she lifts up some plastic and well there are the Yashila lentils she said under certain conditions for an exhibit that Linda Sheely's organized and organizing we might lend these so I had the the golden thing Take in it. my hand <laughs> yeah did you feel like you had found yourself while you were working on this like did you feel that passion that you did not I, feel for I did. music I did that's a really good question and I did um, and, uh, because it let me, it let me do something that, um, you know, and I, I, at that point I started working on graduate studies with Linda mm. as well as trying to organize this exhibit. Um, but it, uh, as it happened, the exhibit came first and, and that led to a 10 year career organizing international museum exhibitions all over the world. <laughs> Because people said, well, if you can do this. So you were sort of an archaeologist slash art historian. Yes. Sort and, of. And, and, and exhibit organizer. Wow. And so we worked a lot in, we worked all over the place, in Japan, Europe, um, but a lot in the Soviet Union, actually, um, right as it was ending. So you're, you're 10 years doing archaeology. You're spending a lot of time in the Soviet Union. Are you well, only? It wasn't. In... It, wasn't it, it evolved. It wasn't ten years doing archaeology. Sorry, t- it was it museum was ex- years exhibitions. organizing exhibits, and I founded a nonprofit, uh, and um, and and that was its purpose. Mm. And uh, and and I knew the formula, which was to get the best person on the planet, and get and you know this. I learned another thing from this. Most people will talk to you <laughs> if you if you just get in front of them and you have something interesting to say. And I think people. Um, don't approach people because they're afraid that they won't. Now, some people won't talk to you, but most people will. That's so, so interesting. It's true. If you try, if you don't try, that's right. And yeah. you don't know. And and what are, what, are, what are you going to lose if you if you if you don't if you try and it doesn't? But it has the, it has something interesting and something that's helpful to them as well. As opposed that's to right. Just an yeah. ask. That's right. Um, and uh, any rate, so. So we um, decided to do this program of of exhibit exchange between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, and this would have been started about 1988 and um, uh, 87, I guess, and um, and you know by 1991. So so I was there during this whole thing. I was in Moscow when the Berlin Wall fell, and um, dealing with the Ministry of Culture and. They were saying, you know, oh no, we're going, we're going ahead, and we're doing these projects. And so we had an exhibit of contemporary Soviet and American artists. We had an exhibit of mid- medieval icons and that kind of thing, and several others that, um, that that were were really great shows and went to major museums. And but the Soviet Union fell apart mm. in the in the middle of this. So, you know, who are you going to deal with? And you know, we did end up dealing with the Russian Federation, but it um, it was a front row seat in history, I guess would be the way to yeah. put it. And, and it was fascinating to see. And, you know, that also affected my worldview very dramatically because I saw how quickly things could change mm. and how quickly even something big that seemed like it was never going to change, never going to go away, could just vanish. 
that's an interesting way to put it because people forget it's you know it seems like part of history and yeah. it seems like there was a cadence to it but you're right there were a lot of rapid changes and that's no right. one thought that would go and down you know, that and, way and, and i had seen this in in um in a different way in the work with linda sheely on, on the maya because they had completely revolutionized uh, the old school of the maya was was beheaded by people who had been through World War One, mm. and they couldn't accept that these these um, carvings showed violence. They thought they they were about astronomy and one group of stars overtaking another group of stars and so forth. And and uh, so there was a complete paradigm shift. Mm. Uh, and and I also did some work in college because I wanted to do something scientific in in geology and geophysics. And at that time, there was a complete sh paradigm shift there which was plate tectonics, you know, that the yeah. full of plates. And, and and so I had seen now three examples of, of things that just could utterly shift in a moment's notice, that, you know, figuratively speaking. Mm -hmm. I mean, it maybe took a year or two. It didn't with the Soviet Union. I mean, it was just snap. And, uh, and that really has been a foundational thing in terms of the work that I do, because I think one of the things that people do, and uh, I've discussed this in a lot of different talks, is, they think that the near future is going to be like the recent past, and it's not necessarily going to be. Mm. And so, and that's an that's an a, unnerving thought for people. It's there's an unnerving thought. There's a people. comfort in thinking that you, the frameworks you operate on, are that's right going to have some consistency. Right. But I'm so, here to tell you. <laughs> I'm here to tell you that's not true. So, were you only doing sort of museum work and artwork while you while you were traveling around the world? Because there's some. There were other things that I I, I got involved in. Um, uh, I was very much dealing with the the U.S. State Department and um, and because they were interested in this because the so many countries have a ministry of culture mm. and they wanted to emphasize to uh, to these countries like the Soviet Union that the U.S. doesn't have an official ministry of culture. You have to work with private institutions, and they said you you're perfect. You're, it was called intercultura. He said, your, your organization is perfect because you're not one museum. You deal with all these museums, yeah. and we can use it to show them they have to deal with a uh, a private institution. So they would basically give me offices in the embassies and, and, and backed it, and, and that led to a lot of interesting meetings and involvements and so forth. And um, so I did that for 10 years. So and you were a, a dip would you describe yourself as a diplomat? Uh, not formally, but it was it was cultural diplomacy, definitely, and uh, so I did that for ten years. And what... wait, wait, one more. So just to back up on that, because you know there are there are, I don't know if there are rumors, but there are stories that, and Peter loves to tell them who are here with that you were more than a diplomat. Well, there are lots of stories. I, I did all sorts of things. So um, you know there. There are, um, I, I certainly did work for, um, you know, and helped when I could for organizations that, um, that were not in diplomacy formally. Um, uh, that go by familiar acronyms that we might know? Uh, they, they would, some of them, yeah. Um, the, the one that I really did the most work. Uh, How does that happen? Do you get recruited? Do they find you? Uh, yes, they do. And, um, and they're interested in lots of different people doing lots of different things. Because it's um, very, it's very Hollywood that uh, an archaeologist museum exhibitor would also be a spy is a very Hollywood plot. Well, I wasn't a spy per se, but um, but yeah, it, it is very Hollywood. Like it, it's very, uh, it's very much of a um, almost a cliche, you know. But but you uh, might predate that. Maybe what we think is your life reflecting Hollywood is Hollywood very reflecting your life. No, because if you look back at the early uh, intelligence officers in. World War One and World War Two, they often came from academic backgrounds and often archaeology. And, you know, archaeology, like music, uh, is about patterns. Mm -hmm. And intelligence is about patterns. It's about seeing patterns in a mass of data and pulling them out and revealing hidden information, things people don't want you to know, don't expect you to know. And, uh, and that is the, it really the fundamental technique of, of, deep investigation and, and intelligence. It's paying attention. It's paying attention, but it's paying attention in a certain way so that you, you're able to sense subtle indicators 
and 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 find things that and, and the way you do that is by looking for anomalies, things that don't fit in a pattern. You see what the pattern is, and then you see, wait a minute, that that shouldn't be there. That's that's unusual. Sometimes it tells you something, sometimes it doesn't. Mm. But if you find four or five of them, then it's telling you something. Mm. And and this is this goes back to what we were talking about earlier. People who have straight line thinking, they ignore them because they say, well, that's not because they're irrelevant. rushing somewhere. Yeah, they're rushing somewhere. And and uh, you know, I'm a big fan of the uh, of of the, the the people who study um, uh, bias and and uh, you know Kahneman and so forth. Mm. Um, Thinking Fast and Slow mm-hmm. is a great book. Everybody should read it. And um, and if so, it, it is a kind of slow thinking. And uh, to 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 pull these things out and to and to reject the the um, the obvious explanation of things. It's called zero based analysis. That's what we call it at well, my company. Did you feel did did you feel like you were taking big risks doing that? Did you feel unsafe? I, I certainly felt like I was taking risks. Um, you know, I I um, I didn't really feel unsafe. I, I don't scare easy. Um, uh, well, your the, grandmother didn't scare you. No, I don't she think didn't. anybody you're meeting at that point in no. your life is going to um, scare you. So uh, I did feel, you know, that some concern at certain points in time. Mm. But uh, you know, you 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 get to. Uh, where you can just deal with that, or, or if you can't, then you there don't. are certain things you don't do. You know? Yeah. But in any event, um, I, I'll, I'll tell you what what got me out of that and that next trade was that I, I ended up what had been a fascinating career, you know, of doing working with all these experts and everything became a career in raising money, and I was just constantly talking to people. To raise money for the for the nonprofit for the, for the nonprofit for mm-hmm. these exhibits and things and and you know some people love it I I don't mind doing it in small doses right but it is not a fun thing for right me. so all the other parts of it you love but the raising money part which is was a big yeah. part of it became too much it, it's just too much and so it, 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 it kept me from doing the other things again you're getting pulled away from your love of that's the right. original love that's so right. but then you so your second trade. That's interesting you say that because your second trade is one of your worst, and that is becoming a VC and raising money in Latin America. It, it, that's it's true, and I and and it, it's a different kind of fundraising. Okay, um, uh, very different. Um, some of the things are the same, but uh, but it is. Um, I mean, you're raising money, and that raising money is raising money, but um, it, the appeal is different, and um, it it's. Uh, it's not. It, it, I didn't find it as exhausting. And you're and you're doing this in Latin America. I'm raising money in Europe to invest in Latin America. So you, uh, sh- an emerging markets exit. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. That's what we would call it now. This was in the mid '90s. So right. The, in those terms. It was third world and yeah. terms like that. Although really, Mexico and those countries are not third world countries and haven't been for forever. And did you find early success with that? Yes. Um, we had several interesting projects. Um, uh, Mexico was just booming at the time. Mm. Um, NAFTA had just been it was signed during this period, uh, and it was um, it was it was great because you know people really were interested in seeing you in in London or wherever in in Europe to talk about how they could be part of it. And so we had we had projects that focused on um, infrastructure and information. One was a, a a a chain of movie theaters, um, which which Mexico was lacking. Mm. Uh, I mean, not lacking totally, but there there was no nothing big and powerful. Uh, a, a a a whole big project of parking garages and an information service on on Mexico and what was going on. And these were all going great guns until the peso collapse of the mid nineties. I think it was ninety six, mm-hmm. uh, maybe ninety five, but. Um, and it just became, you know, nobody would. Everything got on hold. Yeah. And it was, it was, um, it had been a fascinating uh, time to do it. Uh, you know, I live in Texas, and so it's very, it was very easy to go back and forth. So it's it wasn't a bad trade in that you began to hate it. It was just the market circumstances overwhelmed you. That's right. Yeah, it, it just wasn't. It wasn't really possible. Mm. 
unless you had a very, very long horizon, which I didn't. And so so you go from being in Europe and, and in the Soviet Union, and now you switch jobs and you're doing this. Do, do you ever, do your old bosses come and now that you're in Latin America, be like, oh, hey, wait a minute, we still need you. Are you ever able to, to sever the intelligence part of it? I would think it's a long rope that well, and the and the uh, uh, yes and also even the arts part of it the, the the exhibit part of it people would call me and say well you know i know you did this project in ethiopia can can you help me and i said well i'm really not that business well can we just have lunch and talk about it sure okay you know so, so they kind of circle the, the, there's never a clean cut from never, those no, other no. yeah <laughs> and i'm on the board of two museums Mm. Right now, so um, and what about the intelligence? Did that follow you as well? Um, it did, and I and it followed me in a very interesting way, which is that uh, one of the problems at that point in time, and it's still a problem for a lot of people, is you you couldn't find out what you really needed to know about a counterparty in an investment, mm. and particularly in a foreign country. But I knew how to do a lot of this kind of research, so I just did it for myself. Right. So, so you're not working for the government anymore right, when you're in Latin yeah. America. You're just sort of um, looking at it through the well, VC I, lens. Well, I was never w really working for the government. Uh, I was, you know, it, I was always heading this nonprofit. And um, right. things were, you know, just lots of things happened around various, you know, uh, the, the circumference of, of it, I guess you would say. But um, we call it freelance, but freelance. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, there's a lot to be said for freelance. There's a lot to be said for freelance. Um, but any event, uh, that it was another one of these changes that, I mean, it, it happened in, in late December of, I think, 1995. And, um, and, and literally in three weeks, everything changed. Everything changed. So there's a pattern with you. That's right. Getting. So I now expect change. I mean, that's just, it's it, 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 it's warped my mind yeah. to the point that I, I, I'm, whenever things are too stable for too long, I, I, I'm uncomfortable with the idea. Is that, that a gonna, bias you have, though, do you think? Probably. Based on probably. your experience. Yeah. But I, it, it, it's a bias that is, um, I think, reflects the reality of how the world works. You know, I mean, yeah. you, you just, it, it, you know, pick up the paper. And it's, you know the the iPad screen. Yeah. And um, I mean, look look at how fast uh, AI generative yeah. AI uh, and 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 now AGI artificial general intelligence has has you know less than a year ago everybody thought it was going to take ten years, and suddenly you know it's they're so well, rapid. It's just how the world you know you don't you don't die of a heart attack over a period of a year. You don't have a car wreck over a period of a month. Yeah. That, uh, but we have, our mentation has somehow um, warped our perception of reality so that we expect uh, things to be stable. Continuity. And continuity. And I've actually talked to some brain scientists about this. And they're, one of them, at least, his theory uh, that he's pretty, you know, adamant about is that the brain uses so much energy that it's a way for the brain to, to cut down on the energy use, just to assume that things are going to be the same. And um, indeed, you know, in in a in a prim in, in the world that we grew up in uh, as a species, mm -hmm. there were long periods where nothing changed. You know, you, yeah. your life was like your great great grandfather's, but that is not the world we live in now. No, and but we still have that that bias. It's in, also hard to operate in yeah. in sort of flight or fright. And when things are changing rapidly, you're at a heightened awareness. That's right. So it's it is it does take a lot more brain power. So it would be easy to see how you could convince yourself to. It's sort of why New Yorkers don't look at people else, anyone else on the sidewalk. They just look at what's ahead. Right. It would take yeah. too much. It would be too taxing to yeah. engage everyone you pass. So you. It's a, it's a misconception. They're not rude. They're just conserving energy. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, so and, and, in the same way, it sounds if, like what you're describing. Someone on the sidewalk has a knife. It is. <laughs> yeah. You see. Yeah. <laughs> it, 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 I mean, yeah, you better look. So did you right. did you lose a lot of money? So this the, 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 this bad trade it ended in kind of in an unexpected way. Did was it? Did it also cause financial strain? It did. Yeah. yeah. Because I used a lot of money to to make this happen. I, I mean, I had an apartment in Mexico City. I would go down on Monday and come back on t a Thursday most weeks. Um, I love Mexico City. It's one of the great cities. Um, you know, the culture, the food, the 
music, everything about it. And, and I have lots of friends there. And it didn't, it didn't make me negative about Mexico. It's just one of those things that happens. Yeah, it's just one of those you breaks. Know, and so your third trade is taking that bad situation. And I don't know if we could say reinventing yourself, but you sort of come up with this next phase of your career, which is starting an intelligence company. Yeah. company, But like a, a sort of, uh, how would you describe the intelligence company? Like uh, a geopolitical. It, it's it's more than that. And it's it's a little bit, it does include that. Um, uh, it, it We call ourselves a private intelligence agency. And and what happened was, you know, um, again, I was just lucky that to know a lot of people. And so when the Mexico thing mm. Um, you know, collapsed. Uh, I went and talked to everybody I knew who could give me good suggestions. And uh, actually, I knew the head of the DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency, uh, who said, you know, really, D, you know how to do this kind of research. You should start a private intelligence company because the, and this would have been in um, 1996, I guess. Mm. And he said the, the amount of information that was previously only available to governments is now available and becoming more available in the private sector. And, and you have these huge databases that are, that are being uh, put together uh, that you can search and it's, it's a time like no other. And, 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 you know, it, it, there's going to be a, a huge need for it. So I took that advice and, and started, uh, and, and we did a, a wide range of things. Uh, we in, Within a few years, focused in on it, we did we did do work with the U.S. government as as subcontractors for for projects um, that were totally geopolitical mm. and and um, what they call CT counterterrorism. Um, but uh, but but it quickly became obvious, partly because I had, knew a lot of people in New York, but but for other reasons as well that that focusing on investors was mm -hmm. going to be the way to build a business. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we, that's where we, we ended up focusing. And, uh, and, and the company still focuses on that. We do a lot of work for lawyers um, on, on, you know, legal intelligence. And uh, we do a lot of uh, other kinds of things for operating companies. Uh, but, um, but, the, but the, the deep dives for investors on counterparties, on, you know. So you're sort of like a detective. That's one thing that we do. But what we do with, you know, a project, let's say, uh, in um, for, for a large investor, most of our clients are, are very large investors, pension plans, mm -hmm. you know, private equity, hedge funds, family offices, all that sort of thing. And, and for someone who's putting a lot of money into a project in, let's say, Malaysia, um, or or uh, Peru, uh, they want to know who they're dealing yeah, with. Yeah, the partners are on the up and up. That yeah, they're... they're on the up and up. That you know, how corrupt are they? Um, uh, who are they connected to? How politically exposed are they? If the politics change, are their fortunes going to go south? So it's a whole dossier, basically. That's right. On the... Yeah, and and as well as looking at at at, at kind of scanning risk, mm. um, so that you you see these exogenous risks that are not captured in balance sheets mm -hmm. and, and income statements and, and pro formas. And that's what we focus on. We never, we don't do anything with numbers. I mean, we do statistical things, but, but we don't focus on any financial aspect. We focus on non-financial due diligence. And that goes from geopolitics and politics to um, uh, entities and people. And then this kind of 360 degree uh, so, you know, we had a project where, um, one key thing that had been overlooked was that it was a, uh, it was dependent on the, the it was an agriculture project, uh, it dependent on, uh, snow melt from a large range of mountains and that was going away. Yeah. And so, you know, oops, it, yeah, <laughs> there's no glacier. And, and, and this is, again, it's a straight line thinking that, that I think people, they they just they default to and it and it it really can keep you from seeing you know the, all the, the other clues big around alligators out yeah. there in the swamp that are on the side it's it's funny we've been talking a lot about ai and how ai is changing everything but what you're describing sounds like human intelligence it is now now i will say that human intelligence it, they call it human 
H-U-M-I-N-T, has a very specific meaning in the intelligence world. And what it means is active collection of intelligence by people talking to other people mm. or observing people and so forth, um, uh, as opposed to OSINT, which is open source intelligence, mm -hmm. which is very powerful now because of all this mm -hmm. information. Uh, and then there are all these other tech and in, in imagery intelligence, MM, and so forth. But 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 in a in a bigger meaning of it, it is absolutely human an analysis. And and there's a very specific reason why uh, AI can't do it, and I don't think we'll ever be able to do it uh, in the foreseeable future. Uh, and that is that the way AI systems operate is they operate on by being trained in existing data. So they are great at finding patterns that repeat past patterns, but finding these anomalies, uh, mm -hmm. they can find the anomalies, but they can't make that leap to mm -hmm. what does this mean? Mm -hmm. What what does it say about the it's, future? It's the, the curious thing that that doesn't fit. Yeah. That's, and that's not really what that they're they're really looking and, and, for and something then else. Then there's a there, then there's imagination, which is hugely important. And in fact, you know, they, they will say that uh, a, a a big problem uh, is is failure of imagination. Mm -hmm. That's a term in the intelligence world. Mm -hmm. And you know, for example, uh, the 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 twin towers. It was a failure of imagination yeah. to to you it was know, crazy. take seriously the idea. The, the recent um, attacks uh, by Hamas in Israel. They, they it was a failure of imagination. They didn't. Mm -hmm think that even though it it was you know it didn't require any advanced weapons no. really and everything but they didn't think about that they, they read they 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 read the signals in the core and not on the sides so they didn't think about that being a possibility yeah. that they should take seriously and this happens all the time. Yeah. And um, it, again, it's it, it's this straight line thinking. Yeah. Which, as, as you might have teased out, I'm, I'm against. Yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah. think it works. I yeah. think it hurts hurts people's projects. Yeah. Some... Yeah. No, I I can I can see that, and it's and you can, you can sort of understand why that's an untapped area and why people it's our it's our blind spot. If you it know. is, and you know, there's a lot of um, tradition that uh, at like Occam's razor is a you know. Is a well-known um, logical device mm. that says that basically says that the simplest explanation is the most likely. Well, that's true, but if you're if, if this thing doesn't fall into that explanation that you're looking at, you will miss it. There's a wonderful series of articles every I don't know whether every week or or so in the New York Times about medical prod problems that look like all these different things but aren't. And, yeah, we're fascinated by that, by the way. Like anytime yeah. there's podcasts on that and stuff, yeah. we're always like, oh, you know, it's that, it's the, so we're drawn to them, but yeah. somehow we can't, we don't often we don't, teach we don't, ourselves we to. We don't integrate it into our, uh, our daily And that's your process. superpower. I guess so. I don't think I have any superpowers, but I, but I do think well, that that's. Well, it sounds like. Well, you've got a few. <laughs> I've been lucky. <laughs> so you keep telling me <laughs> when I'm not buying it. So your fourth trade is that you decided, uh, and explain this to me, decided to attempt an industry roll-up just before COVID started. What do you mean by that? So, um, and this is a bad one. This is a one that, you know, again, learning experience. Um, uh, the, the private intelligence industry is made up by in large part of small companies that specialize in certain things, like Strategic Insight Group, my company. And um, and they exist across a continuum. Um, uh, some are, are are true pure intelligence companies. They're about information and and, and that sort of thing reaches us. But it, it goes into security and it goes into um, uh, cyber things and so forth. So huh. the idea was pull together a whole group of these companies that um, uh, each could cross sell and each could complement the needs of of clients intelligence inc right exactly and um and it it was really going pretty well until the pandemic happened and it just made it in, and, and you had you had several you know at least a double whammy the pandemic and then the interest rate things which mm -hmm. as you know changed everything about how deals are done mm -hmm. and it's kind of starting to normalize now in a different way but you know so many of these things were 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 very debt driven. Mm. And uh, in fact, 
you know, it was, it was highly, dis- I, I had it all lined up. I had all the companies, you know, we were ready to do it. We had funding and, uh, and it just, it just became an, an impossible thing mm-hmm. to do. And, um, but again, there's a silver lining, which is if we had done it, if we had gone ahead or it had happened six months earlier, then we would be in a structure with a debt load that would be um, impossible. So in in the, so many of these things, they're, they're not good or bad. They're, they're things that they seem bad. They seem really disappointing or really unfortunate, but as things work out, you know, you may be better off when yeah. these things happen. Did the bad trades feel like failures or just feel like unfortunate incidents? A little of both, I yeah. think. Um, but, you know, the thing is that I, I knew uh, that that it was the it was the external environment mm-hmm. that was doing it. And um, and and so, you know, what can you you know, that that's something I've also learned in doing all this is that you really should only worry about things that you can control. And that is a tiny, tiny bit of the world. Mm-hmm. And um, it, it once once these macro forces take over, nobody has any control over them. And, you know, th- this is one of the things I think that that has led to the one, one of the things, there are several, that has led to the rise of conspiracy theories because people would rather believe that um, that somebody who's against them is in control of things than to believe that nobody is. And the bus is just careening uh, you know, on the edge of the cliff. That's what I see. That's a fascinating observation. That's a fascinating observation because they're, we're, it's rife and yeah. tribalism. Or they would rather put someone who arguably is insane or deplorable or a strong man or, you know, we wonder why there's a shift back to authoritarianism because there's order to that, even if it's horrible order there, there, as the, opposed to chaos. There's a promise of order and there is order. Right, there's a promise um, uh, in, 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 for, for a, a certain period, but it never, it doesn't work if you look at history. It, it just doesn't work because the world is not controllable that way. We don't have that power as human beings. And, but, but it sells because people are, are like, well, just let them take care of it. And I, Craving that, of right. Mind. So just give me the rules. Just yeah. give me the rules. Yeah. Well. How and do you, how have you, because you not only have that worldview, but twice have been bold or blindsided by things out of your control. How do you live with that sense of? Well, it goes back to what I've said. I expect change. I expect that that's going to happen every once in a while. And um, Do you have discomfort from that at all? Um. Not from that per se. I, I have a lot of discomfort uh, for my children and my grandchild mm-hmm. in terms of what the world's going to be like for them in twenty or thirty years. And I think it, 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 it yeah, you know, I think there are possibilities that it will be good, but I think that there are uh, or better. But I think there are also a lot of possibilities that it will be terrible. But there, there what I can do to affect that is very minimal. So I don't really. Um, I, I try not to uh, to feel discomfort because the world is the way the world is. Mm. Because what's that going to, how's that going to help me? Right. It, it is the way it is, you know. I, they, you know they're very interesting. The, 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 um, the Stoic philosophers in ancient Rome and Greece were, uh, were very articulate about this, you know, that, that you really should, should worry about the things that you could do something about. And and not not other things. It, it takes a changed mentation from what we mostly have, at least in the West. But um, if you go outside Western cultures, and I grew up kind of in, you know, outside and inside, mm-hmm. you, you see that that kind of thinking and and all these different you know states of consciousness and so forth, we've kind of excised that uh, out of our experience, but. But those things will help you in just accepting, you know, changing what you can change and accepting mm-hmm. what you can't, which is most most things. Mm-hmm. And most of the time, it it, it 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 sometimes they're very important, but most of the time they're not for your particular life. Yeah, helps when you have all those sh- shaman objects in your exactly. house. Is it? So do you think that you? So you've you've 
had this view, all of this experience, you see the world constantly changing and blowing up and know how dangerous it is. Dangerous it is. You probably have a lot of information that we don't. That's probably a burden to carry around. And yet you have always put yourself in the position to keep evolving and changing and learning. Did you ever have a thought where you just say, I want to just put my head in the sand? I, 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 oh, there's sure. enough. I have yeah. enough. There's too much. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. You know, or, or you know, just um, move to some beautiful place and 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 turn the TV off, unplug turn the, the TV phone, off and pour myself a drink and and read, you know, something written three hundred years ago. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, and and you have to fight against that if you're going to keep doing. Now, I do think that you know, at a certain point, people, and I know a number of people who never let go of the of the rat race, yeah. even into their 80s. Yeah. And, you know, they're flying on their planes and doing deals and miserable. And, you know, and I've said to some of them, well, why don't you just, you know, smell the roses? I mean, you've earned it, you yeah. know, many times over. And, uh, and that, I think it gets back to this thing we were talking about with music is that, that, that this passion, this, this, this need, they have to do this. And I'm frankly glad that I don't have that yeah. because it lets me let go of things. Uh, you know, I, and I think that's letting go is one of the big secrets to life, I think. And it's really hard. And, and a lot of people just, they won't entertain the thought of it. They, they keep these things inside them, circling around and mm. getting angry about. And so, and why? What does it do? How does it help you? How does it help anybody? It's a question we have to ask ourselves. D, we this could be a four hour movie. I hope this is this is made into a series. You gotta write do the book. This I has know, been amazing. It's, a, no. it's been amazing. Thank well, you so thank much. You. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure. We hope you enjoyed the video. At Real Vision, we help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy with in-depth analysis from real experts. Join the revolution at realvision.com.